Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 121, Styles and Types of Board Games. I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record these shows live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, and it would be awesome if you could join us. All right, last week we spent a large amount of the show, like over an hour, discussing the board game mechanism of engine building. One of the things we decided by the end of the discussion was that it may not be a mechanism or a mechanic at all, but rather a style of board game that's created by a combination of other mechanics. So today, to kind of follow that up, we've got a question from one of our guests in the lobby, that's our chat room here on Twitch, about board game types, and I thought it'd be a good follow-up from last week's topic to talk about all kinds of different board game types in addition to engine building. Once we get to the game room, I'll be reviewing two different board game types that my kids really enjoyed. First up, Fairy Season from Good Games Publishing is a card game that uses the ladder climbing mechanic and Harry Potter House Cup Competition, which is a gateway engine building game that uses the worker placement mechanic. Finally, in the week in review, I've got to play a fun fair, which is an engine building card game with my daughter and Deanna and I tried out Junk Orbit, which is a pick up and deliver traveling game for the first time. Welcome to the suggestion box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. First, we've got a comment on our Wonder Woman Challenge of the Amazons unboxing video. Mike Riley writes. This was on my radar over the holidays, but missed it. Still interested, though. I think the miniatures looking like metal makes you want them to have that weight. Mm -hmm. Reminds me of Horrified, one of my favorite Ravensburgers. Thanks for the peek. Totally agree with you there, Mike. I got to say, looking at pictures of this game online, um, because it is out by Ravensburger, there's been a lot of sales on it recently that we've been talking about since Boxing Day, really, at... um, at tabletop underscore deals on twitter and we're like man this looks like it has metal miniatures and it looks worth it for the the, i think it's like a 20 dollar cost right now and it wasn't until like even when i opened the box when i did the unboxing i looked at it and i thought they were metal until i picked one up and realized that they were so light they're plastic like they're they're painted gold they're supposed to look like statues now they're still solid miniatures with lots of detail but metal would have been much cooler Though I'm pretty sure metal probably would have added 10 or 20 bucks to the cost. And for that reason, I'm pretty happy they're plastic. Now, since then, uh, we've actually played Wonder Woman. And I think you did miss out there, Mike. Like, um, I got to say, it's a solid game. Uh, We talked about it during the Bellhop's Tabletop segment last show. Uh, So check that out if you haven't already to hear my initial thoughts. But I got to say, so far, it's a thumbs up. And thanks for the comment, Mike. Well, Nancy left this comment on our review of The Shining Escape from the Overlook Hotel. We're trying to find something that lists the contents of the envelopes so we can put them back in the correct envelope. Do you know if anything is listed anywhere? Oh, Nancy, I'm sorry to say that the last time I looked for this, I couldn't find anything like this. Nothing like this seems to exist. There's definitely nothing uh, official. There's nothing from the op or the Bamboozle Brothers, the designers of the game. What I expect there to be soon, if it isn't there already, because I didn't say check today, is something posted by a fan on Board Game Geek. I'd be really surprised if it, like I say, if it doesn't exist already, there probably should soon, someone will post a forum thread asking for that information and someone will get back to them. What we ended up doing to put the game away ourselves was we just basically grabbed the books and flipped through them and looked for where it said open envelope and then use that to figure out what to put back in it. Though I got to admit at this point, uh, especially because we had a pre-release copy, we're just going to toss ours out. So I don't even know why I took the time to put everything back in. <laughs> but I do get it if you purchased a retail copy because you can't pass that game on to something else, which is the advantage of those games, the um, Coded Chronicles games over, say, like the Escape Room Exit games, because you can replay them. Well, you can't, someone else can play them. You technically could replay them, but you probably wouldn't want to because you've already solved the game. But you can pass them on to other people or you could sell them to the secondary market or donate them or put them into an auction or whatever else. Sorry, I couldn't be more help. Uh, Like I said, as far as I know, there's definitely nothing official out there. Maybe a fan's got you covered by now, but I'll admit I haven't looked myself to check. All right, well, the next comment was from one of our older articles where we suggest six-player games. Jeffrey Eshright writes... You're missing Bang the Dice Game, or its replacement, Finger Guns, The Chameleon, and Just One all work great. I love Camel Up as well. 
nothing like betting on camels racing. I, I, I got to say, I appreciate it when someone finds one of our older older pieces of content and actually takes the time to comment. So thanks for that, Jeffrey. Um, I'm sorry to say, personally, I've, I've never been a big fan of Bang, either the original card game or the dice game, even though one of my best friends is, like loves that game and used to bring it out to every party and every event. It's never been for me. And as most listeners should be aware by now, I'm just not a fan of social deduction games. And that's pretty much what Bang is. This is also the same reason I've never even tried the Chameleon. This is another social deduction game where one player is the Chameleon trying to fit in with everyone else. You're probably not going to find any of these types of games on any of my recommendation lists, though we will sometimes toss them into honorable mentions if we know they're popular enough. Now, just one probably should be on the list, to be honest, probably in that honorable mention section, but I don't think it was actually published at the time we put this article out. Like, this article is two years old now at this point. Just one's pretty new. So it was out, it was, I didn't have it yet, like I hadn't heard of it yet, or it wasn't out yet. So this is one that I, I actually do strongly agree. That's a party game where um, players are trying to get another player to guess a word, and you're each giving one word clues. But the thing is, if you duplicate the clues, they cancel each other out. So that's why it's called Just One. And I got to say, that sounds brilliant. Now, I'll admit, I haven't tried it. Uh, last time I tried to get a copy of Just One was out of print. It's back in print now, but my pile of shame grew enough that I don't need a new party game right now. Plus, if you're like most of the people in the world right now, you're not playing any party games anyway. Though I have heard this one works particularly well on Zoom, so it might be worth seeking out. As usual, we'll throw these game recommendations into the show notes for people who actually like social deduction games. I know there's lots of you out there. Enjoy. I have no problem with you enjoying them. Just don't invite me to play. <laughs> Now, finally, we just want to give a thanks and a shout out to the Spence Magna Games blog. Now, the other day I was on MeWe and I'm in a tabletop gaming map group where people are sharing their cartography skills and stuff. And I'm like, all right, cool. And I'm scrolling through and I see some uh, a link to a blog post. It's a picture of ghost fighting treasure hunters. And I'm like, wow, I guess you could use the board for that as a dungeon map. I don't know. It's kind of weird. So I'm like, I want to see what this person has to say about ghost fighting treasure hunters that has to deal with maps. So I click on it and it led to an article on the Spez Magna Games blog where they were raving about how awesome ghost fighting treasure hunter was. And also talking about some dungeon mapping cards. So it ends up that the post had nothing, like the, the part of the post I saw had nothing to do with the thread it was in. They were actually there to talk about the other thing. But the cool part was that Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunter section of the article give, gave us a ton of credit. They're like, oh, we learned about this, this thing from Moti, the tabletop bellhop over on his blog. It's one of his favorite kids games. And he, they did some awesome stuff to help promote us. Like they put a link to the blog. But not only that, they're like, hey, if this game sounds cool to you, make sure to go to Mo's blog and click on their affiliate link to buy it. So like I couldn't ask for anything more. <laughs> from someone else pointing to us like that was fantastic so thanks so much spez magna for that and i don't even know how long that article was up it was in their archives because i didn't get like a notification or anything i just happened upon it in me we which then made me of course look all over me we and start googling our name and trying to find <laughs> other stuff but that was the one so what we'll do is we'll toss a link to the article in question in the show notes and encourage everyone to go check out that game blog it looks pretty solid all right well we'll toss a link to that article in question in the show notes uh, and that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. Thanks to everyone who stops in and catches us live in the lobby, our chat room here on Twitch. All right, so tonight, Sean and I are going to try to come up with a list of all of the different types of board games that are out there. Now, this is going to be a bit of a mess because part of the problem is what makes a game type and what makes a game category and what's a mechanic. And we're going to try not to overlap our mechanics much, but it, it's it, it's kind of a messy thing overall. What we're going to be doing is looking to you fine folk in the lobby to catch any we miss. Also, feel free to discuss your favorite games from each type and so on. We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. Tonight, we've got a follow-up on last week's topic of engine building. Yeah, so last week, as part of our discussion on the board game mechanic of engine building, one of the things we settled on is that engine building may not be a mechanic at all, but rather a board game type or a board game style of play. It's not a single mechanic, but rather something that comes out, out during play because of a combination of other mechanics. 
which leads us to tonight's topic, which comes from the first person ever to join our chat room here on Twitch and interact with us, Shadzar. They wrote, I would like to see a show defining game types. Like, what is a dexterity game? What is a legacy game? I want a The Tabletop Bellhop Guide to Types of Games. There you go. So that's what we've got for you tonight. I think this would be a good follow-up to last week. Now that we've decided engine building is a game type, what other game types are out there? While we are doing our best to be as inclusive as possible, I'm sure there are going to be some game types <laughs> we miss, or we'd set a new show, rec uh, show length record. <laughs> if we do miss your favorite game type, this would be the perfect chance to contact us and let us know what we missed. All right, due to the fact we're going to be covering a lot of different categories of games tonight, we are not going to spend much time on each of these. If there's a specific category you want us to deep dive, like we did for engine building last week, hit us up on social media or head over to the blog, click on Ask the Bellhop, and let us know you'd like to know more. So what I am going to do, uh, as we do get through, so Sean's going to give you the definition, our definition of the game, and then what I'm going to do is point out a few of my favorite games in each game category. That way you have some examples that show off each game type. Well, on to the list. Abstract. Games with little to no theme, no storyline, simple design and mechanic usually feature perfect information, little to no elements of luck or randomness. All right, the most well example here is, of course, chess. There's also Go, but then there's a lot of modern games that also fit this category. Some favorites of ours are War Chest, Onitama, and the game Sean and I love the most out of all abstract games, The Duke. Next up is Bluffing. Games where part of the game is lying to other players. They feature hidden information and can include elements of deduction. These also include games with hidden turn planning and hidden movement. So this one's a huge category, actually. There's a lot more bluffing games out there than you would think. The obvious ones are your social deduction games, right? Your Battlestar Galacticas and your secret Hitlers and whatever. But you know what? Moves where you plan your move in secret, like X-Wing or programming your robots in Robo Rally also in bluffing, as do many games featuring auctions, like Power Grid. And next we have card games, games that use cards for the majority of the game. The line where a game swaps from a card game to a board game is a thin and wavy one. Mm -hmm. Some card games can feature a board, but to us that board just has to be a place to put cards. If you're doing other things there, then you have a game that uses cards and not what we would call a card game. All right, the obvious examples here are trick-taking games, right? Your traditional card games, your hearts and spades. Uh, then there's Sean's favorite board game mechanic, deck building, and games like Clank and DC deck building. But this also includes Euro games like Race for the Galaxy. Next up, we have children's games. Games designed, designed specifically to be played by children. Most are intended to be educational as well as entertaining. Thankfully, as time has progressed, designers have gotten better and better at making these fun for adults as well. Uh, Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters remains my favorite children's game of all time. Great fun for the whole family, including just playing with adults. Other favorites include King Me and Go Cuckoo. Just so I'm not advancing too far in time, when my kids were younger, they loved the Haba games like Monza and Goblet Gobblers. Next, we have City Building. Simply ga games about building a city. These games are usually about efficiency and can be about building the most attractive city, biggest city, or the most lucrative city, or a combination of all that. Right here, I can't think of any other game except Suburbia. There are others, but that one is the shining highlight of city building. Fair enough. Next, we have Civilization Building. Games that have you develop an entire civilization over a large span of time. While most Civ building games go from ancient times right into science fiction, others focus on a specific small time frame. These games usually feature some form of technological advancement system, as well as a system for warfare. Uh, through the ages, a new story of civilization is considered by most hobby gamers to be the best civilization game out there in this category. But this also includes games like Gentis, which just focuses on ancient civilization growth. Next, we have collectible games. Games where after getting the core game, you can add content to the game by purchasing additional modules, usually released at a set schedule. 
There is usually a competitive actual play element to these games, and in order to stay competitive, you need to keep up with the various new releases. Some of these games feature random packs and elements of various rarity. Uh, the big boy here, of course, is Magic the Gathering, the most well-known collectible game, but this also includes any game with waves and waves of expansions, like, say, the Morp's most popular Marvel Champions right now, or X-Wing or Imperial Assault. Next, we have Deduction. Games where players need to come up with answer answers based on information presented in the game. There are a wide range of different deduction games types, from social deduction, bluffing games, to cat and mouse, and hidden trader games. Now, Clue, of course, is the most widely popular and well-known deduction game. Code Names is a popular deduction-based party game, and I recently discovered the Chronicles of Crime series, and I've been really impressed by them myself. Next, we have Dungeon Crawlers. Players explore, explore some form of dungeon, fight monsters, and accumulate treasure. This can be episodic or campaign-based, cooperative, or one verse many. Note, dungeon here doesn't necessarily have to be a fantasy-style, go under the ground, around, surrounded by stone cavern kind of thing. Imperial Assault is one of my favorite dungeon crawlers, and it's a Star Wars game. Space Marines. <laughs> yeah, Space Hulk could yeah, be another space, one. Yeah. Uh, next up, we have game books. Now, while some people will debate whether or not these are board games or not, what we are talking about here are the various game books published over the years. These involve the player or players taking on the role of characters and flipping to various parts of the book to complete some form of adventure. Another type of these has two players face off against each other, each with their own book. Uh, examples of game include the classic fighting fantasy books. Uh, my personal favorite back in the day were the Way of the Tiger books and dueling game books like Ace of Aces or the fantasy themed Scarlet Sorcerer versus the Emerald Enchantress. For a much more modern look at this style of gameplay, check out Legacy of Dragonhold from Fantasy Flight Games or the Adventure Games from Cosmos, which has replaced their exit series of games. Well, next up we have Dexterity Games. Games that rely on the physical skill of the players. This could involve stacking, building, placing, balancing, flicking, or tossing. Now, I, I think anyone who listens to the show regularly knows how much of a fan of dexterity games I am. I don't know why I love them. Favorites include Pitch Car, Hamster Roll, and lately, Go Cuckoo. Next up, we have the ever-popular Dice Games. Games that use dice for their primary mechanics. Similar to card games, there's a thin, weighty line that determines when a game swaps from a dice game to a board game with dice. One of the things we think that sets dice games apart is that the dice need to be rolled and can often be re-rolled. Uh, Yahtzee is, of course, the most well-known dice game out there. I personally prefer Farkle if we're looking at traditional dice games. For hobby games, I love Istanbul the Dice Game, perhaps more than the original, and I'm also a big fan of Roll for the Galaxy. Next, we have economic games. Games all about generating income and having the most income at the end of the game. These usually include some form of market system, which could be stocks, but also includes any system of trade. Note, this income doesn't have to be money. It could be any other resource. For a great example of a game, that an economic game that's not about money, Look to Terraforming Mars. It's all about generating those resources near terraforming rating. The, and then if you do want an economic game about money, my personal favorite has got to be Brass and or Power Grid. Those are both way up there. Well, next up we have educational games. Games that are meant to teach you something. For a long time, there was more of a focus on teaching than making these games fun, but this has thankfully shifted in recent yes. years. Uh, Robot Turtles was one uh, that was actually a big Kickstarter kiss, uh, success, which is a great STEM game to get kids into programming. Timeline is a very simple game that's great for teaching some history. But note, all these games don't have to be about kids. Two weeks ago, we talked about a ton of great games that could teach you about history, like Freedom, the Underground Railroad. Well, next we have Engine Building. Games where you start off with almost nothing and use what you do have to build up something more. Where you create a system and run that system to generate whatever it is you need to run the, to win the game. Now we spent a full episode discussing this and our favorite example just last week. Um, to, to just go find, uh, sorry, I wrote that weird. 
One of our favorite examples, again, Terraforming Mars. We spent an entire episode talking about this. Just go find episode 120. Listen to that. Tons of game suggestions in that episode. I think 16 of them, even though I think I said 15 while we were recording. There's actually 16 because I can't count. I don't play enough economic games, I guess it is. But Terraforming Mars is, is my most played engine building game currently. All right, next up we have Exploration. Games involving an aspect of discovery where you will search new areas and reveal more aspects of the game as it goes on. Uh, the one that came to mind right away on this is the Seafarers of Catan expansion for Settlers of Catan, where you put some of the island tiles face down and flip them over. I think that's a great example of adding exploration to an existing game. For a nice heavy media exploring game, check out Mage Knight, where you slowly and randomly expand the map as you explore. Next, we have Farming. Games where players build up some form of a farmland. This usually involves growing crops and sometimes animal husbandry and or building up the buildings on the farm. Managing resources and gradual improvement are important elements. I don't know what it is with board game designers and board game teams and farms, but there are a ton of them. Look at it, almost anything produced by Uwe Rosenberg. Uh, personal favorites include Agricola and Caverna. Well, next we have fighting. While very popular in video games, there are a growing number of board games about close quarter combat. These differ from war games in that they are about personal combat. Yeah, for a board game version of Street Fighter or Mortal Kombat, check out the BattleCon series of games like War of Indines, Devastation of Indines. And for something different, take a look at Spartacus, a game about blood and treachery where you actually control a whole, I can't remember, a house of gladiators because I can't remember the term for what a house of gladiators is right now. Well, next we have horror. Simply games featuring horror elements. Much like the movie genre may be attempting to be spooky, scary, gross, or terrifying. I meant to actually take this off the list. We took off fantasy, sci-fi, and themes. Horror theme probably should have been taken off as well. My bad for leaving that on. Um, a big fan of Horrify is, is Horrified for a classic Universal Monsters look. And for something unique, check out Nyctophobia. So some good horror game recommendations. But I don't know if that's a type. That to me is more of a theme. Right. When we removed sci-fi and fantasy from this, we, we probably should have taken off mm -hmm. horror as well. And then we have humor. Games meant to be funny and get players laughing. This includes a wide number of party games, but can apply to games with humorous elements as well. So Telestrations is the game I always think about when everyone talks about laughing at the table because every extra life we all make ourselves ill at about three in the morning from laughing so hard. An example of a game where humor is part of the game, but it really the driving force is Munchkin. It's more a more serious game with humorous themes. Uh, see, but wait, there's more is the first one that comes to mind for me. Yeah, that's a good one as well. Uh, next, we have Legacy Game, a game that adds some form of permanence with each gameplay. This could mean unlocking new content, or it could be modifying or destroying existing content. What you do during one game affects all future plays of that game. Uh, Gloomhaven is, of course, the most popular legacy game out there and has been for a number of years now, whereas Risk Legacy from Rob Davio is considered to be the first legacy game. For those people who don't enjoy destruction, don't watch Mo playing Gloomhaven as he giddily any tears legacy. up. <laughs> Jesus. Don't watch me play any <laughs> legacy game. Don't get the effect of will tear up the cards. All right, math-based games is our next topic. Games with a significant level of math where playing well is based on using math skills and doing calculations. So this is a, there's a huge range of games in this category, ranging from pretty much everything Rainier Nitzi has ever put out. Uh, one of the lighter ones that I still really enjoy is Kingdoms, to math-heavy games like Power or very math-heavy games like Arkwright. The last time we played, people pulled out calculators in the middle of the game. Well, next we have mature or adult games. Games with adult themes, usually explicit humor or depictions of adult situations. So when I put this on the list, I almost kind of giggled thinking about it. But you know what? It's easy to dismiss this just thinking about games like Cards Against Humanity and those games meant to offend people. Games I'm not personally a fan of. But there are a number of games that approach adult themes well and reasonably. Examples, Consentical, Starcrossed, and even Time Stories has some really adult things where the first game in the setting is set in a madhouse and you are playing people who have uh, mental problems. And to be fair, on our last Extra Life auction, 
one of the biggest sellers and, and the things people were most interested in were a couple of adult uh, yeah. oriented games that, that were up for auction. So people totally enjoy fair. the category. Uh, next up, we have mazes. Simply games that feature mazes and or maze-like elements requiring players to navigate a path. I lost myself. Where'd it go? Sorry. Uh, Robo Rally is my favorite maze-based game. Uh, another modern one that's it's a lesser-known game from a Canadian designer is Quad Heroes that features a lot of trying to navigate your way through a maze-like board. Well, next we have memory games, games where players are required to remember previous game elements, often combined with deduction. Now, note this doesn't just mean the classic game memory, where you just match cards. A uh, good example of some modern memory-based games are Hanabi. Um, my kids love the game Magic Labyrinth, where you're trying to remember what a map looks like, uh, an invisible maze looks like, which combines our last category. Next, we have miniature games. Here we're talking about miniature battle games, games where the miniatures are the main components and the game board or scenery on the table represents the physical area around the miniatures. Not every game with miniatures is a miniature game. Many of these games also include hobby elements like assembly, painting, and building scenery. So Games Workshop is still the... the, the overarching uh, master of the miniature games and there were various Warhammer games. There are a number of other miniature games out there like War Machine, Infinity, or the growing popularity of Gaslands, which is post-apocalyptic and just uses uh, dainty cards. Next we have Murder Mystery, games all about investigating a murder and trying to figure out the details of the crime and who the perpetrators are. See, this one I wasn't sure if it should be a standalone category or if it just fits in with deduction. But there are a ton of games specifically dealing with murder mysteries. Now, personally, I'm a huge fan of Chronicles of Crime. Specifically, the 1400 was a lot of fun. But these also include all the, the party style games, the dinner party games, the how to host a murder, stuff like that. Not something I'm a huge fan of, but they add some LARP elements. So because of that, I kept it on here to counteract going with the fiction because of the, that whole RP LARP element to those murder mystery games. Next, we have negotiation. Games about making Sean, deals oh, there we go. and alliances. Sean had frozen. Many negotiation games also feature the inevitable betrayal when those deals and alliances are broken. Uh, Diplomacy is probably the most well-known negotiation game famous for ending relationships. Uh, Chinatown would be a personal favorite negotiation game. Next, One vs. Many. A game where one of the players is competing against the rest of the players these games include games with Dungeon Master style player who controls the game, monsters, and many hide and seek games where one player is trying to hide from the others. Uh, Fury of Dracula is a very popular one versus many hide and seek game. And then the Descent series of dungeon crawling games is an example of one with that overlord or keeper or dungeon master. And most recently, the Ravensburger Jaws game. Yeah, that's a good example of one that does it completely different. First up, part's hide and seek. Next up, we have party games, games that play a high number of players at once where social interaction is the key element and main goal, usually very easy to teach with simple rules. All right, my favorite party games include code names, concept, and one Sean mentioned earlier, but wait, there's more, which I got an expansion for for my birthday, so I can't wait to Ooh. play again. Next up, we have Point Salad. A game where there are multiple different ways players can score points with no particular way better than any other. Stefan Feld is famous for designing point salad style games. And my favorite Felds include Amerigo, Trajan, and Carpe Diem. But an example of a non-Feld point salad would be the sci-fi 4X game Eclipse. All right, well, next up we have print and play. Games where you are meant to print out the game components yourself or combine printed components with stuff most people have readily available, like dice and pawns. The game is published in digital form. Uh, we recently reviewed the Roll and Write Roll for Lasers that was a print-and-play game. Absolutely, and uh, this year, this last year or so, it's been a major driving force in the game industry. Yep. And next we have puzzle games. Games where players must solve a puzzle. Could be cooperative games or competitive games. Many competitive puzzle games end up being called multiplayer solitaire games. 
So the first thing that came to mind for me is the Exit series of games, the, the, the Escape Room games. But this also applies to polyomino games like Patchwork and games that include puzzles in them, like Mansons of Badness. Next, we have racing games. The goal in a racing game is the, to be the first player to reach some goal. That could be a finish line or a set number of points, which means this includes games about car or horse racing, but also many Euro games. Yeah, the best example of a racing game you don't think of as a racing game is your Settlers of Catan. It's a race to the first person with 10 points. Now, Pitch Car is a race to the finish. Camel Up is a twist on this where there is racing, but you're actually betting on the camels, not trying to get your camel to win. Now, next up, we have real-time games. Games where the players are meant to do something with a strict time limit. This can involve simultaneous play with players trying to compete uh, complete something before other players, or games with timers where players must stop playing or are penalized when time runs out. Uh, Fuse is a very stressful, cooperative real-time game. Galaxy Trucker is one of my favorite real-time games, and Captain Sonar turns the classic game of Battleship into a real-time strategy game. Note, this also includes games like the Exit series, where your final score is based on how quickly you complete the game. Next, we have role-playing. Now, we're still talking about board games here, not pen and paper role-playing games like Dungeons & Dragons. These games have players take on the role of a specific character and make decisions based on what character they are playing. They often feature some form of advancement system where the character grows over time. Again, Gloomhaven would be the highest rated role-playing game out there, but there are lots of board games with role-playing elements nowadays. Next, we have The Sandbox. And no, not the fun one you played with in kindergarten. <laughs> well, no board game is a true sandbox because all are limited in some way by the scope of the rules and the game components available. A sandbox game is a game where you are presented with a large number of options and ways to play the game. These include point salad games and games with multiple paths to victory. The most sandbox game I have played so far to date is Zaya Legends of a Drift System. This is a sci-fi sandbox where you start off with a ship and you can pretty much do what you want with it. Next up, we have territory building games. Games where players are attempting to take over as much of or a specific area of a map. These games often use area control and area majority mechanics or could be about making an enclosure. So most folk on a map games fit here. Uh, one of my personal favorite area majority maps, which I games, sorry, I've mentioned many times on the show is El Grande. But this also includes games like the Castles of Burgundy, where you're building out your empire with tiles on your own personal playing board. And while the most classic example of an enclosure game would be the classic game of Go, which has been around longer than any other game on this list. Next, we have Trains. Trains is another mechanic along with farming that board game designers can't seem to get enough of. There are any number of games based on railroads, rail routes, rail vehicles. These range from very simple to extremely complex. Yeah, there really isn't anything much simpler than Ticket to Ride, which features trains. Then you got games like Steam, which is a pick up and deliver economic game that kind of fills in the middle. And then, well, you've got your 18xx games on the highest end of that complexity scale. Next, we have transportation. These games are all about moving something from one place to another to score points. Almost every train game is a transportation game, but there are non-train transportation games as well. So a personal favorite of mine would be Keyflower, where you are transporting goods around your village. Uh, Zaya is another example where you could be a merchant and bring goods from one planet to another. And Brass is one of the best transportation games ever made, in my opinion. Next, we have travel games. Travel games where you move about on a map or a grid to different locations may or may not include exploration, and something is gained by visiting a high number of locations. Uh, travel is an element of one of my favorite games of all time, Orléans, uh, even more so with the Trade and Intrigue expansion, and it is a huge part of Coimbra. Next up, we have trivia. Games that test players' knowledge about a particular subject or range of subjects. Uh, Trivial Pursuit, of course, is the most well-known. Personally, I'd much rather play Wits and Wagers. Next, we have War Games. Games that attempt to recreate military action. These exist for pretty much every historic timeline, but also for a variety of sci-fi and fantasy themes. 
This category pretty much covers anything from small unit engagements to epic battles and multi-year wars. A Command and Color Ancients is my current favorite historic war game. If I want to go into the world of sci-fi, I am a huge fan of Star Wars Rebellion. And that would be my favorite non-historic. And for something completely different, but still a war game, check out Root with its cute little animals. Next, we have Word Games. Games where players are challenged on their vocabulary and knowledge of words and their interactions. Almost all of these are very language dependent. Yeah, Scrabble, of course, is the most well-known word game in, in the world. Uh, Letter Jams, the one I played most recently and really enjoyed. Uh, Codenames is a very popular party-based word game. And just one is one on the top of my wish list. Well, that's it for our list of board games. Now we're going to head over to the lobby and see if anyone in our chat room has anything to add. All right, you fine folk. What do you got for us? What so there's categories a, did we forget? A lot of a lot of chatting uh, going on here. Uh, we have, uh, let's see here. Poker is one uh, that's a bluffing game. It's yes. a card game. Uh, so there, there's what we missed. Okay, so what we should have had at the start of this or at the end of this is that almost every board game out there is going to be a combination of one or more of these. Yeah. It's very seldom you are going to find a game that is just one type or one category and what we're hoping is that i could take any game off my shelf downstairs and tell you which of these previous things we talked about it is combined because none of these are standalone so yes yeah. poker is a card game and a bluffing game and a deduction game i would say as well because you were trying to count the cards and i would say a math game because <laughs> you were trying you're doing if, if you're playing properly and a memory game so you got memory so like that's it's that's all part of just poker Yep. Right, because you're trying to remember where the cards are played, you're trying to count the cards are played, so you got math there. I'm not even counting the scoring, <laughs> and then you've got the bluffing, and well, and then there's an economic element if you're actually using betting. There's something we don't have on here, we don't have gambling games. Gambling games probably could have been on the list, that's one I think we missed. Yep. I think gambling is definitely a type of game that would apply to more than just poker slots. Uh, I, I'm trying to think, I know I own games downstairs where, where you do it uh colt express is what type of game so it's programmed movement which is a mechanic um what would i see take that maybe should have been on our list so it's a program movement game but again we determined the program movement before was a mechanic not a theme it's a western themed game it is a uh take that game which we do not have it's on a the fighting list. game it's a train it's bluffing. game it's a train game. It is a fighting game, yeah, because there's indiv individual combat, interpersonal combat. Definitely not a war game. Um, uh, it's a memory game. Memory game, yeah. There's definitely memory elements. So I think having Take That, so here's a new one. Take That, which would be games where players are competing with the other players, doing, taking actions to interfere with the other players' plans in some way or another. I could probably come up with a better definition, <laughs> not just off the top of my head. So those would be Take That Games examples being Munchkin, being the biggest Take That game out there, where everyone's trying to get to level 10 and everyone else is trying to prevent someone to get to level 10. So, there are Take uh, That elements in many games. As, as a quick crib off of BGG, competitive maneuvers that directly attack an opponent's progress towards victory, but do not directly eliminate any characters or components. Right. So they have that listed as a mechanic, not so a that's category? A mechanic, yeah. Yeah, see, that's a... The, the whole what's a mechanic, what is a category oh. is so messy. It really Absolutely. is. Absolutely, yep. Like, what I actually think we need to do is, is, I was telling Sean this before we started, is just the tabletop bellhop list of game terms yep. and mash both together. And, and, and honestly, I, I, was, I mentioned this in, in a sort of a joke when we were chatting earlier, but we could honestly do one episode a month of, of definitions and keep that yeah. going for a year at least. I mean, there are Probably. just so many different terms used in board games, which are either uh, unique to board games and gaming or are used differently within board games and gaming. Uh, it's just, you know, there's a lot of language involved in the game industry. We could add a segment even or a once a month. I don't know. I, I if you want to put the list together, we can define them. <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to think where we'd start. We want probably want to go alphabetical and how we keep track of what we've covered already and what we haven't. Yeah, we'd have to keep a shared doc of, you know, here's the full list of, of terms we've done. And, you know, 
the yeah. line when we. No, All right, I kind of went off on those early team. What else did we have? Uh, we I had uh, and people. People do love Farkle, uh, but also yep. we're bringing up Liar's Dice, which is both oh, dice a good one. and bluffing. Yeah, Liar's definitely. Yep. Uh, Chinatown is that an economic game? Yes, there, there is. The, it's an economic game. It is a negotiation game. Trading is a mechanic that is usually part of negotiation games. So that gets into that one. I actually have a very firm definition of. I, it is definitely a negotiation. This is the purest negotiation game ever played because everything is on the table. You can you can trade money. You can trade spots on the map. You can trade goods. You can make promises. You can even do a, I'll take this off my hand now and give you $10,000 in the last round of the game. Like, like everything's on the table, which is why I like Chinatown. Uh, Chinatown also includes um, area area control and area majority, so territory building. I was trying to think of what we called it on here. Chinatown is also about territory building because you were trying to make sets of similar types of stores in Chinatown. There are a lot of mechanics, again, that go into Chinatown. Uh, what else do we have here? Well, Jeff Jeff is is partially trolling us and talk, when he asks <laughs> us to talk about how not all games about trains are train games. So in Power this Grid case... is a train game, but Ticket to Ride is not. No, see, the problem is Jeff is confusing train games with route building games. Not all route building games are train games. In a train game, there has to be some form of, uh, of of doing more like upgrading where you don't get that in Power Grid. You're, you can't improve your engines or anything like that. But in this definition tonight, we just trains. It's games that feature trains. Right now, train mechanics is definitely more to it. A Power grid, grid, I would not consider a train game. Yes, you're building routes, but that's route building. That's the reason I don't actually consider Ticket to Ride a train game. It's a train themed game, but to me, it's not a train game. Right. Because there's, there's no there's a train theme but it's, and, and it's, it's interesting rummy. this it's game gin. this game we actually had uh more discussion about the ask topic prior to uh show than possibly any other topic yep. we've had before because uh, there's just so much language involved here whether something is a theme a mechanic a class a type um you know there's yeah so we were using the words. type style and in, in um category are all kind of three of the same thing right. to me tonight because i know one of the things we talked about uh one of the big ones was sports games right is yes. sports a theme or is it a type of game um and we ended up you know things like um sports horror uh sci-fi mystery western became themes so we yeah. weren't discussing those tonight other than uh, we slipped horror yeah i forgot i slept in horror accidentally but, i meant to take uh, that off but we were calling those themes rather than types, which is what this episode was about tonight. What it was supposed to be about, yeah. <laughs> we, we tried. So what I haven't seen is anyone mentioned anything we missed, except for, like I said, um, someone brought up Colt Express. Colt uh, Express. I wonder if you can consider Colt Express a maze. Hmm. With the way you move on the different tracks. The main thing I was trying to think of is: Have I ever described take types that, yeah. of we games? Take, so take that. Yeah, is take what we that missed. should be. I, I want to make sure we add it to the blog version. That's part of why. And I want to throw that in the lobby section here. So give me a second while I take a short note. I feel like there's probably there's got to be more, but it's. I was trying to think of how, how I describe a game. Like if someone said, "How would you describe Harry Potter House Cup competition?" I'd be like, it's a gateway engine build or a worker placement game with engine building mechanics. So you tend to describe things by mechanics. By mechanics, yeah. Um, whereas a less um, experienced gamer will probably default more towards type and theme. Right. Because they, aren't as, they just aren't as familiar with all the individual mechanics. Um, and then occasionally, you know, sometimes they will confuse, you well, know, yeah. theme before mechanic and, and mechanics become, you know, become things maybe like, maybe the tabletop bellhop list of terms to describe board games <laughs> and that that'd be both because it would just yeah. not just board because if we do board game terms we got to define like meeple and yeah and all that that's even bigger that, well, and I, but board that's game I, component terms well and, that's the thing though i mean realistically that's you know and you get into euro trash and or ameritrash and yeah we've and covered euro that and, you know and and just getting all those terms defined um and and out there helps the industry really i mean you know but the more people who understand the way people talk about games, the more people who can get into the, the hobby. So that's actually been done. I was trying to find the name. Building Blocks of Tabletop Game Design and Encyclopedia of Mechanisms. 
was written by Jeff Engelstein, and it just came out last year. No, sorry, two years ago now. I keep thinking 2019 still. Last well, again, year. mechanism. Again, mechanism is only part of it. Yeah, right? but if you look at it, they they he does they basically out, uh, say they do they, it, hundreds of different mechanisms organized by category. Each has a description of how it works, of its pros and cons, how it can be implemented, examples of games. And it can be read for cover to cover, used as reference, and it's meant to have encompass all the themes and encompass like it's yeah. it's trying to be more than just mechanisms. So But I mean, but again that that book's gonna miss out on probably miss out on something like Meeple, right? No, or, that's a, yeah, that wouldn't have more trash. Games and, terms. and and I think and I think there's a, a more general um ongoing list of board game themes um where you know i don't i again and uh, games is saying against smooshing it all into one list yeah um i don't know if you would maybe do one blog and then just add to that every time we did it on an episode or you know keep keep a blog updated with everything we've talked about or or how how mm -hmm. you would present that on the blog but uh i think uh, you know throwing in a five minute section in the podcast where we just added in talk about new words isn't a bad idea at all yeah maybe we can toss it in you and d work on the list and i'll give you definitions <laughs> <laughs> it just sounds like something else i gotta figure out every week um so anyway i should pick this up at some point it's jeff engelstein and isaac shalev i'll drop a link to it in the notes i like i should try to find a pdf of this like i'll write jeff and say hey or i just buy it i don't know i could i could just get the kindle version or something i'm sure oh my god Okay, so the Kindle version is ninety six seventy. Ouch. Uh, so maybe not. <laughs> the hardcover is one hundred and eighty three seventy one. Like, is this not MSRP? Well, no, Someone's that's marking it's, this it's up. Probably uh, like a textbook, right? Wow. Textbooks are always okay. That's that's more than I plan yeah. to spend <laughs> to check it out. Yeah. But anyway, it's supposed to be the definitive, and what they were trying to do with this book is come up with common terminology so that. People would differentiate area control and area majority and differentiate the same everywhere. Right. Which I, I appreciate the goal of this book. Um, Jeff went on a ton of podcasts promoting it back when it came out. I wonder, like, oh, I wonder if he does cool. a different uh, differentiation between the deck building and deck creation that we've talked yeah, about. Yeah, I don't know. That's that's why that, I, that I'm like, I, I would love to flip through this right now and I can't. <laughs> because, um, so it's broken into game structure. So competitive game, cooperative game, team-based game, solo game, semi-cooperative game, single loser game, trader game, scenario mission campaign games, score and reset games, and legacy games. So they definitely have some of the things we were calling types here. Right. And then turn order and structure, fixed turn order, uh, static turn order, bid turn order, progressive turn order, claim turn order, pass turn order, real-time turn order, punctuated real-time, simultaneous action selection, roll order, random turn order, action timer, time track, past action token, interleaved in sequential phases, lose a turn and interrupts. That's just turn order and structure. Yep. That's, yeah, that's definitely that's definitely textbook material. That's why yep. it costs 180 bucks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then by resolution, critical hits and failures. Rock, paper, scissors. I'm trying to see if I see anything about Game end and victory. Wow, there's a lot. There's race. Mm -hmm. Player eliminate. Player elimination. We probably should have defined. Push your luck. Economics. Wow. Sorry, just this list is impressive. I I should open this up for our research. Yeah, right. Auctions. They they have sixteen different types of auctions. Worker placement is its own. Like, but there's they have eight different types of worker placement. Uh, Twenty four different types of movement. So, so what they have, so area control. So instead of having area control, area majority, they call them all area control. And what they, what I call area control, they call absolute control. And the other area majority slash influence. And actually, I think that makes perfect sense. That's a good way to word it. Because absolute control is only you are in there. You right. control it. Whereas majority is you have the most or you have the most influence. Right. He also has troop types, territories and regions, area parameters, force projection, which has to be one of those where you control one area, so you have, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, with Tyrants the Under has that, where yeah. because you have a thing here, you have influence on the spot next to it. Yep. Zone of control, which is another thing where you place a thing and you have control over a mount behind it, and line of sight, which is an interesting place to have it. Yep. Here we go, card mechanics. So they have deck building as its own. 
drafting is separate. So they don't have deck building versus deck construction. Right. Here. So I figured it out. Melding and splaying. See, that's one I never <laughs> think of. Which you played Innovation, where you splay yeah. the cards this yeah. way. Or you play them that way. All right. Well, yeah. I think wow. we're going to wrap this up. And as our last, I'm going to let uh, one of our Twitter followers get the last word in. Okay. Brock Wagner on Twitter says, there's only three types of games. Big box, medium box, and small box. No, I disagree. Look at <laughs> back there. What the heck's that? Stupid box? There's stupid box, too. No offense, Renegade Games. I like most of what you do. That's a dumb box. <laughs> Well, finally, if you've got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop. Welcome to our review of Fairy Season, a ladder climbing game about catching swarms of fairies. Before we start, a big thank you to Good Games Publishing for sending us a review copy of both. Fairy Season was designed by Dan Fish and Gavin Jenkins. Features some really cool looking artwork from Sean Andrew Muttonhead Murray. It was published in 2019 by Good Games Publishing. In Fairy Season, players play goblins who are trying to catch the biggest fairy swarm they can. This is done through ladder climbing card play. Each fairy card played must have the same or higher number on it than the last fairy played or be from the next season. Goblin cards mess with things, and then there are four royal fairies that can help you get out of a bind. But if one goblin manages to catch all four of the royal fairies, that player instantly wins the game. A somewhat vaguely dark topic, but I think done in a beautiful and tasteful manner. Now, besides the box and instructions, all you get with a copy of Fairy Season are cards. Lots and lots of cards. To see the box and these cards, be sure to check out our Fairy Season unboxing video on YouTube. So the cards include 64 season fairies, two of each fairy numbered 1 through 8 for each of the four seasons. The four royal fairies, which are the king, queen, prince, and princess, and 16 goblins, two of each of eight different types of goblins, and six trap cards. Now, the card quality here is excellent with nice, sturdy, standard playing card size cards, each featuring some really nice evocative art. Each different season of fairy has its own artwork, and each of the royals is completely unique, and each goblin type is different. Now, while I do love the art they used, I would have preferred to have seen a different piece of art for each individual number. So you'd have eight different summer fairies instead of one summer fairy and all the cards. But I can see how that would have cost a lot more and probably up the price of the game. The rules of the game are pretty simple, 11 pages long, very clear, lots of examples using shots of the actual game. No complaints. So how is it our goblins go about catching these fairies? All right, well, setup of a game of fairy season couldn't be easier. Shuffle the deck, deal five out to each player. Done. You don't even have to pull any jokers out or anything. Starting player is the person to have last eaten a mushroom, who will pick one card from their hand of five and play it. Now, usually they want to choose a spring or summer fairy, but this isn't a requirement. The player will then take the action shown at the bottom of the cards. Players will then play one card per turn onto the growing pile of cards in the center of the table, called the Swarm, until one of the players can't play. That player is said to have flunked, and the player previous to them will collect the entire Swarm and put it in their scoring pile. So if you don't like mushrooms or have an allergy to fungi, you'll never get to go first. Nope. But I need to keep my complaints about first player issues to myself. I don't know, it could just be a running meme. Every uh, What I have to do is remember to put it in. I don't always put in what determines a start player. I think I'm going to take more time to actually point that out every episode so Sean can complain about your arbitrary first player rule. Just grab a copy of Schwazi. It works. Yep. What we did actually is our first game, we used that, but we played multiple games, and then we went with whoever lost the last game. So at least it did move around the table. But again, we were house ruling. Yep. Now, the rules for which cards can be played onto the swarm and when are called the rules of the hunt, and they depend on the type of card being played. Fairy cards must be played in sequence, with each card played being either from the same season, having the same number or a higher number than the last fairy played, or being from the next season. Note, you can't skip seasons. Seasons start at spring and go till winter. After playing a season fairy, players will then get to draw or stash a number of cards, depending on what season that fairy's from. Drawing cards come from the central deck. 
Stashing a card means taking it from your hand and placing it into your scoring pile. Now, goblin cards can be played on top of any other card. They should be placed on the deck sideways, so you can still see what the last season fairy that was played is still uh, visible on the deck. Now, each goblin has a unique ability, and it usually has to do with taking cards from the swarm and stashing them to your score pile, stealing cards from other players' stashes, putting them back into play, or stealing cards from other players' stashes and putting them into your scoring area, or passing cards between players. All of them have a very take-that element. Now, trap cards can be played on top of any card but a royal fairy. When you play a trap card, you'll take the current swarm. It's yours, you get everything, unless the next player can play a trap on your trap, or anyone plays a royal fairy, which represents the royal fairy coming in, saving the day by busting all the fairies out of the trap. So it's the opposite of the Uno-style take that, where you're actually trying to take cards from other people, not give them to other people. Yeah, exactly. It, it's the exact opposite of that. And you're actually not trying to void your hand. That would be a bad thing in this game because you want people to continue to keep playing as it goes around. Now, the Royal Fairies are the last type of card. They can be played at any time. They can be played just to continue building the swarm because you want to keep it going around. But they can also be played to free the swarm from a trap, as I just mentioned. In addition, though, if at any time a player manages to get all four of the Royal Fairies in their score pile, the game stops and they win the game instantly. Instantly. <clears throat> now, play continues like this until the last card from the deck is drawn, unless someone's captured all the Royal Fairies and ended the game prematurely. Uh, you then finish out playing out the round with the current swarm being the last swarm of the game. At the end of the game, you have a really simple scoring system. You get one point for every fairy card and two points for every royal fairy. Ties are broken with the player with the most royal fairies, with a second tie coming up resulting in a shared win. Well, I know some folks out there will object to the idea of a shared win, but it's a family game. And to be honest, I don't know what your third breakdown would be. Like, 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 like I don't know what another tiebreaker you could use in this game. They could have went with player order. But then again, you're giving an advantage to that person who likes mushrooms. Yep. Fairy Season overall is a very simple card game, very family friendly due to that simplicity. I decided to check out this game because I thought my kids would like it. And I'm going to base my thoughts on that premise. I am looking at this as a game to play with a family. Now, a full game of Fairy Season is very quick, about 15 to 20 minutes tops, uh, with a big chunk of that actually being shuffling the cards and adding up your score at the end of the game. This is the kind of game where you don't sit down, play one game of fairy season and move on. You're probably going to play multiple rounds. The first time we played, I think we played eight times in a row. So, yeah, and as with many card games, they really tend to be the sort of thing, especially where families will play multiple times in a row. Unlike sitting down to a board game where generally most people expect it's one and done in a family situation. Yep. So the gameplay in Fairy Season is very straightforward, right? It's basic ladder climbing. Uh, ladder climbing is, a, is almost as popular as trick-taking in different parts of the world. It's a traditional card mechanic. You see it in games like Tichu, the Great Dalmudi, or President, also known by another name we won't mention on this show, where players are playing cards from their hands that have to be a step up the ladder from the last card played. Now, in this case, that ladder is the combination of card number and card season, which I actually thought was a nice thematic tie-in to different seasons of fairies, and it works well. This, combined with the Goblin and Trap cards, adds a Take That element again. So you have your ladder with Take That. Now, the Take Out That elements can be a turnoff for some players, especially when playing with younger kids and families. A large part of this game is taking cards from other players' score piles and either putting them back into the swarm or stealing them outright. Added to this, we found the Traps, Royal Fairies, and some of the Goblins add a higher-than-expected level of randomness to this game. So if you're looking for a strategic ladder climbing game, you're going to want to stick to your teachers. So really, if your family likes Uno or other similar card games, I don't think it's going to be any more random or aggressive than playing one of those. No, I totally agree. It's, it's, it's as expected for this type of game. Just I thought there might be a little bit more of a strategic level as opposed to random level. There is some strategy, though. Now, one of the things I do like in traditional card games is the shoot the moon aspect where you can collect all the things to get points. Uh, that's why Carts is probably my favorite traditional card game because of that ability to get all of the bad scorecards where if you collect them all, you actually get positive points. And I appreciated finding something like that in Fairy Season. Now, in our plays so far, we have had one win due to someone collecting all the Royal Fairies. But more importantly, we've had other games where a player gets close and the other players had to make sure it didn't happen. 
which is exactly what you want to find with the shoot the moon mechanic. I, I like the overall feel of gameplay in Fairy Season. I felt the cards were well balanced in their abilities. Like the early season cards are all about drawing cards and the later season cards are all about storing cards. And again, I think that fits the theme, right? At the beginning in spring, you're gathering and in winter, you're storing. Again, I, I like that tie-in. Yeah, whenever I see something like the winning by collecting all mechanic, I do worry as the designer really needs to a careful balance to make it just hard enough. Uh, but it sounds like they were successful in this instance. Yeah, I haven't had any complaints about it working. So overall, uh, Fairy Season, simple to teach, easy to play, quick playing game, great for kids and families. Now, it's not the most thematic card game out there. There are some good ways the mechanics are tied into the whole fairy, goblin, and season theme. So you're getting more than you would from, say, a standard card game. Personally, I think the simple gameplay and high random factor is going to be a no-go for hobby gamers. Anyone who wants more complex card games with more player agency. But I did have fun playing this one with the family. But most importantly, my kids both really enjoyed the game. Now, both my kids, uh, their ages 10 and 13 at this point, were able to pick up the mechanic quickly and learn some of the strategy and tactics after only just a small handful of games. Both were very happy to play multiple games in a row, and it took quite a few games plays to want them to move on to something else. So I did like that. It wasn't definitely wasn't a one and done. They both loved the artwork and the theme, and my youngest really liked to take that nature. She loved being able to play a goblin or a trap and, and win everything. She was a big fan of that. If you're looking for a family-friendly playing card game with a cool theme, one that's based on traditional ladder climbing card mechanic, it's worth taking a look at Fairy Season. This is even more true if, like me, you have kids that are really into the fairy theme and like goblins and they're into Brian Froud and that whole aesthetic. If you're looking for the next great ladder game filled with deep strategy and tactics, you're not going to find that here. This is a quick filler game that's great for playing with kids and non-hobby gamers. Be sure to check out our written review of Fairy Season over at TabletopBellhop.com. And now a review of Harry Potter House Cup Competition, a worker placement game set in the Wizarding World. Before we start, a big thank you to the op for sending us a review copy of this game. Our Harry Potter House Cup Competition was designed by Nate Heiss and Cami Mandel. Features artwork by Delaney Mammer. The Harry, this Harry Potter-themed board game was published in 2020 by The Op, who are also known for a number of other Wizarding World-themed games like Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. House Cup Competition plays two to four players, with the average game being about an hour and a half long, but stretching on the longer side of things. Now, in House Cup Competition, each player leads one of the four Hogwarts houses, sending their three students to various locations and classes to improve their skill level in three areas and collect magic and knowledge tokens. They then trade these in and use their class skill levels to complete challenges and earn points for their house. The house with the most points by the end of the semester wins the House Cup and the game. For a piece-by-piece -piece look at what you get in the box for this game, check out our Harry Potter House Cup Competition unboxing video on YouTube. Now, the only thing I think needs to be called out here is one highlight and one disappointment in regards to the components. So the highlight is the House Cup Hourglass display, which you build out of cardboard, and it holds four plastic test-type tube-like vials. Uh, they call them hourglasses, but they look like, like test tubes with a cork stopper. Now, with these, you get a bunch of these small plastic gems. Now, these aren't your usual aquarium gems. These look like little tiny gems in the four Hogwarts house colors. Now, what this display is used for is to track your score during the game with players putting gems into the appropriate tubes. Now, not only does this just look cool, it's just a, one of the coolest looking scoring markers I've ever seen. I love the fact how you can quickly look at it and get a good idea of what everyone's score, score is without knowing exact numbers. So you don't get that whole... You're ahead by five points, so I need to do this to be... But, but you can kind of look and go, oh, this person's ahead, so I have to try to, to, you know, get the leader. And I like that it's not exact, but gives you an idea. And I think anyone who follows board gamers on Twitter has probably seen pictures of this really fun component at least once on someone's timeline. Yeah, I, I'm really impressed by that that particular piece. Like, I want this to be used. Hey, designers, publishers, use this in other games. I don't I don't know exactly what other games. Like, if you got a science game, you got pieces right there in there but i really like this now i did mention i do have one big disappointment and that is the chronography used throughout the game uh on the game board and on the cards 
Uh, for one, they are black and bland and no color whatsoever. And specifically, the one used for potions and the one used for Defense of the Dark Arts are extremely similar. They are, they are roundish shapes. One's actually like a, a, a jar and the other's a shield. And the two look like they both widen out at the bottom. Like they're not just hard to tell apart across the table. I have messed up with cards I am holding in my primary hand. So I've messed up with cards in zone one, going back to other podcast episodes where we talked about the zone play. And like in regards to these two icons, like I really wish they were less similar or featured some color coding or something to differentiate them besides just a, a black amorphous blob shape that is similar to another black amorphous blob shape. Yeah, and in fact, Diaz mentioned that a Sharpie or a paint marker may come into play in order to make the game playable in the long term. Mm -hmm. And it is never good when that is a solution you need to take to your board game. But how is Harry Potter House Cup competition played? All right, so put the big board out on the table and everyone pick a house. Grab the stuff for the house, including the common room player board. Um, the nine level trackers you're going to place on that board to show that all of your students are at level one in each of the three different classes. You're going to grab the tokens for your three students, your two basic lesson cards and two knowledge tokens to start. And then the second, third, and fourth players get some additional starting resources. Off the top of my head, I don't actually remember what the start player function is in this game, so Sean can't complain about it this episode. But I'm sure it's something to do with the person who most recently attended school or cast a spell or something. You, Schwazi, or whatever system you want to go first. Now, you're going to take the deck of basic lessons, shuffle them, place them on the board, and put three cards up into the market. And then do the same thing for the advanced lessons, the easy challenges, and the hard challenges. These are all Hobbit-sized cards. Room location cards, these are bigger cards at the appropriate level, are randomized and placed onto the four location spots on the board, and the level one location is placed face up. Now the gameplay goes over seven rounds, split over two phases, in which players will complete lessons, send their three students out to locations on the main board, collect resources and level up in their skills in three different classes, and then hopefully complete challenges to earn points for their house. So there's quite a bit going on. Definitely not a quick filler game. No. Uh, it is definitely something to note, I think, especially in the Wizarding World games, because up until now, a lot of the games have been a little on the shorter, uh, shorter side, more family friendly. Whereas when you get into that hour and a half, two hour game, you start losing some of the younger kids who just aren't interested in playing a yeah. game that goes on that long. Yeah, this is definitely the heaviest of the Harry Potter games that have been published thus far, especially from the author. So getting into the two phases of the game, and here's where you'll get to see just how complicated it can be, is phase one is classes. So the one thing you do during your classes phase is learn a lesson. You're going to take a lesson card from your hand and gain the benefit on the card. Now, each lesson has a class requirement and can only be played if you have a student with the appropriate class level. So I keep mentioning the classes. So every student is ranked in three different classes, charms, potions, and defense of the dark art. Now lessons provide things like gaining levels in one of those three classes or gaining resources like magic or knowledge. Now there are a small number of these that will also earn you house points, which are tracked by putting one scoring token into your scoring pile for every 10 points you earn. Note that lessons can be done at the start of your turn or at the end of your turn after you've placed a student, which I'll get to next. So hardcore Potterheads might be annoyed at the limited number of classes available, but you can't please everyone. Yeah, plus the fact that you said we have said this is a hard, a heavier game, throwing in even one more class would exponentially increase the difficulty level of this game, both in learning it and being able to complete things. So they just stick to the three basics of charms, potions, and defense of the dark arts. So the other thing you are going to do during the class phase is place one of your students. You're going to take a student on to from your board and place it on a worker placement spot on the main board and take the reward shown on the spots. Now, most spots on the board can only hold one student. Rewards include magic, knowledge, leveling up in one of the three classes, or the ability to take cards from one of the four markets I mentioned earlier. These cards include lessons, challenges, and other types. Sorry, lessons and challenges of two levels each. There's also a spot that gives you a small reward and lets you take the first player token for the next round. Now, most of these worker placement spots are permanent, and they're the same every game you play, the, the, the majority of them. The board's filled with them. Now, the location cards add a number of random worker placement spots that change every game. 
Now, at the start of the game, only one location is unlocked, but more become available as the game progresses into later rounds. Now, some locations are going to feature class requirements. You can't go there with a student unless they have the appropriate levels in the appropriate class. Locations may also have a knowledge cost where you'll have to spend knowledge tokens in order to use that spot. So we're really getting a strong Euro vibe from this game. Oh, yeah. uh, if you're if you're if you've listened to any episodes of this show before. Yeah, this is definitely a Euro game. This is a worker placement game through and through. So phase two is challenges. So what's going to happen, sorry, you are going to go in player order. So you're going to do one of these things. You're going to learn a lesson, place a student, and then someone else is going to learn a lesson, place a student, and keep going around the table until you placed all three of your students. Then you get into phase two, which is challenges. Each turn, you're going to attempt to complete a maximum of two of the challenges, either two easy challenges or one easy challenge and one hard challenge. These are, again, represented by cards that you would have had to obtain by taking the right classes in the last phase. Each challenge lists one or more classes, again, these are the charms, potions, or defense of the dark arts, and a level you need to have in them to get the reward. Now, these rewards, one of them is always a number of house points, so you're getting the, the victory points for the game. And they always include something else as well. That could be going up in levels, grabbing resources, um, or getting knowledge or magic. Now, to complete a challenge, what you're going to do is you're going to pick a set of your students, so one, two, or three of your students, whose total levels combined, this is your students working together, in their classes meets or exceeds the class levels on the challenge card. Now, when completing challenges, you also have the option of spending magic. Magic is one of the resources you can earn by some lessons and replacement spots. Each magic token counts as one level in a class for completing the challenge. It's spent on only that challenge. Magic is not permanent. You're not gaining a level in potions. You count as having an additional level just for completing that challenge. You also must spend magic when you're advancing your students up to level five in a skill or higher. That's just a one-time requirement. When you get to level five in charms, you got to spend the magic. When you get to level five in potions, you got to spend the magic. Now, at the end of each round, you collect your students back. You're going to advance the round tracker one space. A new location comes up in rounds two, four, and six. You do this going around the table seven times, and then you do end game scoring. You get 10 points per gem in your house hourglass. 10 points per class skill you've managed to advance to level 7, and 10 points per pair of magic and knowledge tokens you have left at the end of the game. Player with the most points, their house wins the house cup. So the math on gems is kind of annoying because you get one for every 10 house points you earn and then multiply them by 10 to get your victory points. Um, although, and then everything is multiplied by 10 yeah to get your victory points at the end. So why is anyone multiplying anything by 10 I, ever in this game? I think because they didn't want players to get one house point for doing something like ah. it to make it. Cause you don't never get 15. You never get 12. Everything's right. in multiples of 10. Right. So if you complete a difficult challenge, you might get 60 points. And I think it's to be able to do the 60 points for host Gryffindor. Whereas saying six points for host Gryffindor just doesn't sound as impressive. But then, but the only then, reason I can think of. Okay, and well, that makes sense to get to get you the 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 gems. But then, why remultiply everything by ten for victory points? Well, you're not multiplying it. Well, because you're going to count out your individual individual things, and each one's worth ten. So yeah, I mean, I get. I, I would just say, you know, you get how many gems. How many, uh, you know, yeah. how, how many of this, oh, how yeah, many of it, that? You can do it that way. Just drop the zero. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, on. they just it's, seem to have added a, a level of math on there that is utterly unnecessary. Yeah, I, I, Deanna's pointing out in the chat room that in the books, it's always in multiples of tens, too, when they give out points. Right. So it's a thematic element, I guess. I, and it's it's really, it's, it's, it's one math or the other. Like, doing yes. the math again and for victory points is really the kind of silly point. Like, what they should just do is tell you that every gem is worth ten. And leave it at that and not mention it in any other way. Yeah. So as Sean's pointed out, every hobby gamer listening to this is like, wow, that's that's a, a worker placement game. That's pretty much a basic, pure, not really any other mechanic combined in there. It's, it's a worker placement game. And you'd be totally right. That's exactly what this is. Um, and I can't help but compare this game to Lords of Waterdeep because everyone out there in the world in the big board game industry seems to be convinced 
the Lords of Waterdeep is the ultimate gateway worker placement game. It's a pure worker placement game and the place to start. And I can't help but think that Harry Potter's Hogwarts Battle does that as well. But it's even simpler, even more pure. It doesn't have the investigation or the take that nature that you have in Lords of Waterdeep. This is an even simpler intro to worker placement games. And I think really for a lot of people, what this is going to come down to is theme. Are you a Potterhead or are you the fantasy lover? And that, for a lot of people, I think will probably push them one way or the other. Yeah, I totally agree. So the entire game is sending your workers out to get resources to improve your skills so you can complete challenges. That's it. It's, it's a slow, steady growth engine building system where the more lessons you complete and the more classes you attend, the harder lessons you'll be able to complete and the more challenges you can accomplish, starting off with the easy ones and hopefully moving up to the hard ones. Now, the trick to this game and playing it well is to do that as efficiently, efficiently as possible. And that's actually surprisingly harder than you would think. Like right from turn one of the game, you need to look at the challenges that are face up in the board and try to figure out a way to complete at least one, if not two in the first round. Then every round after that, it's going to be similar. You're trying to make sure you're completing the maximum number of challenges and trying to get those hard level challenges into play and completed as quickly as possible. And to do this, you're going to have to be very strategic with picking your lessons and leveling up your classes and very tactical with choosing worker placement spots to take each round. Overall, this leads to what is a very simple to teach game. Like I pretty much covered it all in my short description above that uses well-known mechanics in pure ways, but combines them in a way that leads to surprisingly deep gameplay. Like, I was shocked by this the first time I played Harry Potter House Cup competition. Uh, if I remember, we did it on live stream for Extra Life. And I still continue to be impressed by the depth of this game. Like, oh yeah, this is heavier than I remember. Uh, and that's certainly a solid recommendation, I think, for most of our listeners uh, yeah. of the hobby gaming uh, side. Yeah, so what we have here is a game that my youngest daughter can play that features a theme she loves but which is deep enough to keep someone like me and Deanna even more so who love heavier games fully engaged while playing. There are some elements of the game I think could be improved. Uh, for one, just the overall look and aesthetic. Like for a Harry Potter, I just want more Potter. I want more Wizarding World. Like I don't want a gray brab board filled with a bunch of brown rectangles filled with icons in it. And it doesn't help that there's the icon problem, right? That a couple of these icons are so similar, we continue to mess them up, as I mentioned before. Like, the only actual artwork in the game that features anything Harry Potter besides the house symbol are the location cards. So locations from the books. And the, the tokens, your worker placement tokens, are the characters in the book. But that's it. Like, this is a game filled, like, a, a setting with a great visual history. It seems like a shame to me to not include some of that in the game. And while our imagery licenses can be problematic and often expensive for games to include uh, and could conceivably push that game out of uh, that price out of reach, the iconography just has no excuse. Oh, I mean, I, that, that, oh, those two symbols, I got to say. Uh, my other disappointment here is, again, just how little that Harry Potter theme actually matters to this game. This has the same problem with Lords of Waterdeep, as Sean has pointed out many times, and pretty much almost every worker placement game, to be honest. Like, I'm certain I could take this game and re-theme it to any other license without any effect on the gameplay. I wouldn't have to change anything. I just have to rename everything and put out some new artwork. Like, it does, it, it feels like I'm putting a token on a spot and collecting, I'm putting a worker on a spot and collecting two tokens. I, it doesn't feel like I'm sending Harry Potter to Severus Snape's Defense of the Dark Arts class. Just, I, I don't get that from this. And the same goes with the challenges. I'm collecting points for having the right levels and skills and handing in some magic. I'm not assembling Dumbledore's army like it says I am on the card. Yeah, so one of the big problems with this style of game and why the theme ends up often feeling pasted on is the lack of structure fitting in with the canon. Um, the wrong people or groups can do things, which breaks the immersion. But if they couldn't, it would be a broken game. You can't have a game where the chosen one always wins because mm -hmm. why would anyone ever play it? Yeah, that was something that came up every time I played with the kids and they, they usually found it hilarious that whatever, they, 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 this person did this thing, that the, the Slytherin 
put together uh, Dumbledore's army or that Malfoy met someone and there was, I don't know. I, I don't know enough Harry Potter background. So I guess that is a good point about the game is you don't need to know Harry Potter to enjoy the game. But if you do know Harry Potter, you could find some things annoying. Another thing that it did impress me with this game is it plays extremely well at all three or plan three player counts surprisingly at two i usually a worker placement games don't work well at two and it worked great now i will say that with four players it runs a bit longer than the box indicates uh you're going to be pushing to the the two hour mark on this especially in your early games um anytime we played with four is definitely longer than i think it says an hour and a half on the box or 90 minutes but you're definitely pushing longer than that so is is it that ap is becoming a concern when you get into that four player because of uh, location limits? I, to be honest, AP is a problem at all player counts. It's just the more players you have, the more AP you're going right. to have. This is an AP heavy game. This is to play it well. Uh, you could just put your people out wherever and level up whatever. But if you were, like I said, it's all about optimizing your turn. It's all about building that engine to get to the challenges as quickly as possible. And like even Deanna and I have had some significant AP going and, and I'm trying to figure out how to combine your three students. So if I use these two students to complete this, do I have enough levels left to complete an easy? Like there's there's a lot of things going on for a game with such simple mechanics. Right. And I think AP is going to be a problem even at a two player game. It just once you get up to four, you're just you're breaking that wall of the 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 time limit on the box. Right. I have honestly enjoyed every game I played of Harry Potter host competition. This is a solid game. It is a great example of the worker placement mechanic being used in a pure way. Well, the Harry Potter theme may not be as well integrated as I would have liked, and there are some graphic choices that I think could definitely be improved on, I do think house comp competition is worth checking out, especially if you've got a Harry Potter fan in your family or game group. But even if you don't, this is an excellent gateway worker placement game. This would be perfect for introducing new players to that genre of game. What shocked me the most about Harry Potter House com Competition is just how engaging it is for fans of heavier games like myself. While featuring gateplay, family-friendly level rules, winning the game takes a surprising level of strategy and tactics. Be sure also to check out Mo's written review of Harry Potter House Cup Competition by heading over to the tabletopbellhop.com and clicking on Reviews. Before so, we move into our week in review and the final part of the show, I think we got some good comments in the chat room. What do we have about our two reviews? Uh, so, well, we got, um, let's see, where are we here? Uh, we have a lot of chat about uh, about players going first. Uh, I think, you know, unmatched having the youngest player go first or seeing things like last person who went to the beach or whoever last read a novel. Um, yeah. Uh, and again, I, I, and I spoke up, you know, my personal thing is if you're going to do it, make it ridiculous so that people can just choose their own way anyway. Uh, you know, right. wh who was the last person to lick a watermelon lollipop as a teenager? You know, just something, <laughs> something ridiculous. And you'll, everyone just knows it's ridiculous. We're going to go off and do our own thing, whether it's Schwazi or youngest or next to the person who teaches. See, but I, I don't like the, anything that's arbitrary where the same person would go first all the time. That's right. what I don't like. Yep. I prefer where it's randomized some way, whether that's roll a die or whatever. I don't like the fact that, like we mentioned, like the person who likes mushrooms is going to go first. Yep. I like it so it's something random. Now, I am still a huge fan of Start Player, which is a game published by Bezier Games, where you draw a card from a deck and it says something ridiculous, and that's what determines who goes first. I've, I enjoy that more than Schwazi. It just Schwazi is so easy. You, you yeah. bring it up on your phone, you throw it in the Although middle. Jeff does bring up the fact that uh, in the post-pandemic age schwazi might be a little more problematic but again I, you know get some alcohol yeah wipes. that's true you know with some alcohol wipes it's all good that's true plus i don't know maybe that you that there might be a touchless schwazi out there um, so deanna pointed out this is going back to fairy season that the 10 year old must have enjoyed this one because she has described how to play in great detail multiple times to deanna now deanna hasn't had a chance to try that game i just played it with the kids Yep, um absolutely. iconography this is this is again jumping back to we didn't have a lot of comments on fairy season i, I somewhere 
I saw Jeff asking something about trick taking. Uh, if you yeah, so if you love other popular trick taking games, how does Fairy Season stack up against that? All right, here's an important thing: it is not a trick taking game. That's that's the biggest distinction. This is a ladder game. So these are two completely different types of card game styles. So in a trick taking game, you each trick is a standalone thing. You are going to play your full hand of cards. The card played, you have to follow suit. And then there's always a trump that can steal a suit. Otherwise, you have to follow, right? That's a trick-taking game. We have a whole episode about trick-taking games. A ladder game is you are trying to play cards from your hands based on a step up, a ladder system. So the best example I have is the Great Don Moody. Someone will play, and you always have to play lower cards, like three 13s. The next player has to play three cards, but it could be three 12s or three 11s or three 10s or three nines. Then the next player is going to, again, play and has to keep going down. Well, eventually you're going to run out because no, there aren't three twos. There's only one, two twos and one one in the game. That's a ladder game. Another example is Teach You, which is a much heavier ladder based game. So there are two totally different mechanics for playing card games. Here in Midwest, in the Midwest or this area, trick taking is huge. Everyone plays trick taking games. But if you go to other parts of the world, ladder climbing games are actually more popular and more well known. Another popular one is President, otherwise known as A Hole. Um, I said Great Down Moody is one of my favorites. Um, Retuki, which we reviewed on the show, is a ladder game where someone's going to put down a one, the next card played on that has to be a two, then the next card on that has to be a three. And it's an interesting ladder because you can actually go up or down. So once the one the two's played, the next card played on it could be a one or it could be a three. So you can go up and down the ladder in that game. Right. And that's why they call it a ladder because you're stepping up or stepping down. They, they could call it stair games, but they call them ladder climbing. So I don't think a, an enjoyment of trick-taking games has any impact because it's a very different mechanic. It's a different style of play. Now, if you like ladder games, it's a really simple light take that. It's, an, it's the Uno of, like Sean said, it's the Uno of ladder games. But I, if you love trick taking, I don't. I you'd need to try some ladder games to see if you like them. I like both. I actually personally prefer trick taking games. My brain works better because probably I grew up with them and I played more of them. Um, and we discovered that uh, Hogwarts Battle and House Cup are all pretty much the same weight. Uh, Board Game Geek has Hogwarts really? Battle as a two point zero eight, while uh, House Cup is a two point zero zero. So essentially See, the, the problem, same number. The problem with House Cup is I can teach you to play and you'll get it. But playing well, I think, is way harder in House Cup competition. That that planning and strategy and having to look ahead, to me, is a higher weight than reacting to the cards that are out in the market at the turn of the cards in your hand. One, one thing I really have never delved into, you know, we talk about board game weight. I've never actually looked at the calculations behind board game weight we can probably do an episode on that we um, have an episode on that did we do a full episode yeah on we did a full episode on board game weight okay <laughs> i i don't remember if we got into how board game geek calculates theirs or not yeah because i don't think we did because that's what i'm sort of see deanna's saying she doesn't think it's heavier than hogwarts battle i personally think it does yeah and well i mean board game weight says it isn't so yeah i i don't know i i think again to play well yeah, I, think I would agree. I mean, I, you know, I, there's no diff, there's no arguing that Hogwarts Battle is hard, but it's not difficult. It's just hard. I mean, it's, yeah. there's so much randomness involved in in what's happening that you know if you're going to win or not isn't as much skill based. Whereas Hog, mm -hmm. you know, House Cup is a skill based game. Yeah, there's there's this is a uh, a feature of this is there's there is randomness because the market is only three cards showing at each one, and it is possible to have you know you leveled up in defense of the dark arts like crazy at the beginning of the game and then no new cards come up featuring it but there is a way to clear the market i don't remember the rule off the top of my head there is a way to clear the market i think it's either spending magic or knowledge you can clear the market to be able to look at new cards and that was another one of those things that was advanced like right. the first couple times we played we didn't do it but by the time we got to the third and fourth play we were clearing the market like crazy we're like nope wipe those i don't want any of those or the take that the, the the next level of gameplay where I realize you're playing Slytherin and you have a tech of a lot of defense of the dark arts. I'm going to wipe it so that you can't take that card. I would say that both Hogwarts and House Cup are targeted at the same market in the fact that they are both gateway games to that mechanic. The one is a gateway co-op deck building game. The other is a gateway competitive worker placement. And I think they're 
probably at the same level of gateway. Like like Hogwarts Battle, especially with book one, like at the start, is a very pure worker or deck building game. Whereas this is a very pure worker placement game. And I think they're targeting to families of gamers, I, where you have someone in the family that knows a bit more about board games and isn't looking for Uno or Monopoly. Right. But they are also sold in Target, right? Like these are both game uh, House Cup supposedly was supposed to be available mass market. I don't know how well it's done, to be honest. Well, uh, yeah, I mean there have been other factors uh, impacting impacting yes, the, like the sales. Yes, they came out on, in twenty twenty. So yeah, they're, they're between between the pandemic and uh, social media issues, uh, there are things impacting the sales of Harry Potter games. Well, there's that as well. Yes. So. All right, with that, I think we are good to move on. All righty. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at games we played since last episode. All right, to start, I played a number of rounds of Fairy Season with the kids. And the only thing I want to mention about that now, because we already talked about this game in our review segment, is that this game is not good to player. Though, after trying it and writing the review, I noticed both Board Game Geek and the game box says from three to five players. So even the designer didn't expect you to play it with two. So that's why I didn't actually mention this during the review, because while it's not fair to complain about a game you if you're not playing at the recommended player count. Designer's right. Don't play it at two players. Listen to the box. All right. Well, good to know that they don't just push it for poor player counts. Yeah. Because it's not like we haven't seen companies who have done just that for the larger market grab that you can have. Yeah. Now, what I wouldn't be surprised to see is a two-player variant of some type where you pull out certain cards or something, but that's not included in the base game. All right. Next up, I introduced Grace, my oldest, to the Wonders of Funfair. Now, two things I want to note here. First off, she was able to pick it up right away and actually played really well. Uh, not only getting the basic rules, but some of the advanced strategies. And what's amusing to me about this is she saw the box on the table and she was scared of the game because it said 14 plus and she's 13. And she's like, oh, this is going to be too complicated. And I got to say, I, I'm wondering now why they went with 14 plus because I don't think that's one of those magic levels that you don't have to do product testing. I thought that was 12. And I'm wondering why they decided 14 instead of 12. Because I could easily see her younger sister rocking this one. Though I got to admit she wasn't interested in playing, so I haven't gotten to try it with her. Now, the other thing to note is she loved it. So uh, she really liked the theme park theme. The, the, the concept of building a theme park really appealed to her. She thought it was very cool. And one of the things she noted that I think is, is worth note mentioning is that she saw it as everything just makes sense. Like everything worked the way you expected to work. Like the way the upgrades work, the fact you couldn't put you can't put air conditioning on a roller coaster and the fact that if you put a flagpole on your ride, it's got to be the top thing. And then once you put a flagpole, you can't go higher. Like to her, it just, it all made sense. Like these cards played in logical ways. So I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. Now to be fair, 14 plus is generally to avoid uh, a couple of things. There's potentially being clumped in as a toy, which is actually, I believe 13 plus. See, uh, okay, okay. And Jeff actually well. mentions as well, it could be content. So you've got your PG huh. rating, which is the, the, or PG, whatever rating, which is 14 plus. So they, it saves them the trouble of having to have someone look at it. I, See, I don't think there's a content issue here, but what I, what Jeff mentioned that makes me wonder is if there is a content like that in unfair and then they just kept the same age limit for um for both of them yeah to be honest i mean age ratings in general are far more legal and less actually set up for children's yeah. abilities or anything else well yeah also to note it says 14 plus on board game geek too which is usually board game geek adjusts like i, I don't even know if i might go eight plus like it is not a hard game you got to be able to read and there's card combos. I like 14 just seemed high. Maybe not. I said the the amusing uh, part was there, that there it are there her. are no votes on fun fair. That's why. Ah, uh, okay. There's no so community go voting vote. yet. Go go vote 10 or 12 <laughs> or something. All right. The other thing I want to talk about this week is I actually got something off our pile of shame. No, not the pile of obligation, but the pile of shame. Games I actually own. And weren't sent by anyone. So the other night, Deanna and I sat down and played a couple games of Junk Orbit. Uh, this is a game from Daniel Solis and Renegade Game Studios. You may recognize Daniel's name from Kodama, the Tree Spirits, which we actually talked quite a bit about 
I don't know, now it's probably two years ago, uh, back when we were gaming at the FLGS regularly. It's a game I like to bring out. It's a fairly simple card game. Now, Junk Orbit is a pickup and deliver game. It reminds me a lot of Gravwell because it's attempting to do a similar thing where it's trying to be realistic about the way you move in space. And the way they do this is that the gameplay of this game is you toss junk out of your ship and how far you throw that junk determines how far you move in the opposite direction. So the game board in this is a bunch of tiles. You have the Earth, the Moon, and Mars, each of which have a number of drop-off and pick-up spots around the outside edge. And they're each connected to each other at set spots. And they make basically a series of round orbits filled with junk. Each turn, you're going to launch a piece of cargo. If you can get it to land on the right destination, you, you made a delivery and you get the score of the tile. You flip it face down. You then move your ship the opposite way based on what you tossed. Then if you're at another spot where you have junk you can deliver, you get to deliver it. Otherwise, you just pick up any junk currently at the spot and you replenish it with a new piece of random junk. Now, the other thing you can do is when you're throwing junk, if you hit another player, it makes them drop some junk on their own. Now, once one of the junk piles, there's one for each of the three spots, Earth, Moon, and Mars, is empty, everyone else gets one more turn. Now, to make things a little more interesting, every ship also has an asymmetric power. Now, along with the base game, there's also an advanced mode where there's B-sides to all the ships and then B-sides to all the planetoids. Now, the ships, the B-sides are all very PvP. It's all about throwing things at each other and knocking junk off. Now, the B-sides of the planets add some advanced scoring mechanics to make the game more of a gamer's game or a little heavier, and it adds things like set collections. So, like, for every three moon deliveries you make, you get bonus points. Well, this one certainly looked fun when I saw it uh, on your table. How quick was it to play? Uh, it's really quick. I wouldn't say light and quick, probably under an hour, possibly under half an hour. Uh, you know what? It's a case I didn't look at my watch. So we did play, um, we ended up playing a couple games in a row. So that's a good sign of how quick it is. So yeah, it's a quicker, shorter one. The, I'm sure the time estimate on board game is probably about right. I'm going to guess it probably says 45 minutes. Now, overall, I really liked it. Deanna thought it was okay. Um, she did enjoy the second game over the first game. And I will note that there is the TARDIS. I, don't, I forget what they call it. The space phone booth <laughs> has a special ability that you shouldn't let anyone use the first time you play. Because what it does is it breaks the orbit rules and the orbit rules are the game, right? Like that's kind of the main mechanic. And by breaking that, I think that that just kind of messed with it. Plus the game was very light and you know, Deanna likes heavier games. Absolutely. I, I really liked the whole movie mechanic. I thought it was brilliant. Like toss junk out one way and slide the other way. It just, it made sense. It was fun. And trying to get combos where you're like, I'm going to throw this piece five so I deliver it here. And that's going to zoom me all the way over here where I can deliver this and pick up these three things so that next turn I can go deliver this. There was a lot of that going on, a lot of kind of combos. I think this one's going to be a big hit once we're out of quarantine and we're able to go back to the local game stores. This has got a great table presence. This is going to be a good easy mode, uh, you know, uh, CG Realm game night game, I think. Uh, and just to go back a little bit, uh, Unfair is showing as 10 plus by vote. Yeah, so, see, so obviously, and Unfair is, I've read Unfair, there is a significant step higher in complexity to Funfair. Right. There is more than just some nasty events. There is more t ride types. There's rules about park capacity. Like there is a lot, and you can take out loans. There's more ec ec economy in it. There's no um, people giving you money to build your stuff. So there, there is a lot of stuff step above weight-wise. So if they're saying that 10-year-olds could play that, I'd almost want to say eight for fun fair, as long as you right. can read. Now, for me, I've had another couple of sessions of masks, uh, and I have to say there's still some aspects of it I'm, I'm kind of struggling with. For instance, the DM doesn't roll. I really want to roll sometimes. <laughs> you always could. You, you could, but I mean, again, but it's part of the, the, the concept of the game is that the GM doesn't mm. roll. Um, and so I'm trying to be good, uh, but I, I always want to, I'm like, oh, could I do something? I could do something here. Or what if, you know, what are the odds that this is? I'm like, nope, nope, I don't do that. Um, and I also, what I discovered at, at the end of uh, our, our Saturday session is I seem to have gotten the combat balance a little bit wrong. Um, and tough. so I'm working on that and trying to find that pocket you can sit in where it comes to a really good heroic battle. Um, I was actually cheating too easy for the heroes. I was making them too heroic. 
uh, and not giving them enough of a challenge uh, to really show off uh, in a fight. So they, they, they need to get uh, a little more roughed up uh, in, in future uh, in future battles. Combat balance is always so hard in pretty much every it game. Is. And it's for me, it was a turn order thing. Uh, I was thinking about turn orders in a far more classic game uh, stance where the the hit back on you know in a masks in a PBTA game as soon as you do a uh, let's see, you directly engage an opponent as if if you succeed if you hit them they immediately take a condition and have an action for that condition every time they take a condition they immediately take an action regardless of of player order or anything and because we're uh, working in you know in a text based form only I've got that set player order. And it's hard for me to want to, to choose to break that. Right. Uh, it would probably be easier for me to deal with that portion at a table because right. you wouldn't have that sort of same structure. Cool. Uh, so how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? All right. So on the agenda right now are plays of Wonder Woman Challenge of the Amazons. Um, we got one game play in. I want to try the other uh, the other bosses bad guys i can't remember what they're called cheetah and circe and i want to introduce that one to the kids um as i just mentioned the last uh bit i have read the rules for unfair so i am good to go on that one i definitely a, a, a step above fun fair though i'm glad i played fun fair like the, the basic game mechanics are identical like it is obviously the same game but there are some elements to that that are going to be very different and, and definitely a different feel um I've learned that it's a longer game, so you're playing eight turns instead of six. And four of those turns, nasty bad stuff happens to you. And multiple times in the books, it worries, it warns you to not get too attached to what you built. So that's a very different element. And the whole loan thing, that is a whole other level of economics that I'm not used to seeing in, in a game that I expect to feel kind of light and fun. So Unfair is looking interesting. Um, I'm going to be looking at getting Guild Masters and un the Unfair expansion to the table after that. Um, so we're trying to try to squeeze all those in in the next couple of weeks before the end of February. So that'll be interesting. And I'm still trying to get Robotech and Vid Invasion to the table. It just hasn't worked out. Deanna's been busy. I've been playing more games with the kids, and that's not one I'm going to break up with them. They don't have any attack license. And of those Robotech games we got, this is definitely the heaviest, most involved. So I don't even know if it would be a good choice even if they didn't know the theme. So we're trying to get that to the table. We'll see if it gets it there. Uh, the other thing, I don't know what to do about this. So the pile of games, for those of you who joined us last week, um, to see the ridiculous amount of stuff that I got for a particular adventure card game. Well, they contacted me today to say they're launching a Kickstarter now to translate the last expansions into English. And they're asking if we can get anything done by the end of February. And I'm like, whoa, I don't know. Because Good Games Publishing, I owed them their stuff by the end of February. Technically, there were no strings attached to this one. So I kind of wrote them back and said, I'll see what I can do. So I'm, I'm going to try to at least maybe get it unboxed. At least then I could show that off. And I can at least give some thoughts on it. If somehow a miracle happens and I somehow find a bunch of free time, maybe we'll get Aventuria. Aventuria? Is that right? Avent Aventuria. Aventuria. Yeah. No D. Um. Yeah. Aventuria to the table uh, before the end of February. We'll see. I, I'm not promising anything. Oh, we'll see what we can do. So that one might be coming up. Uh, the other thing I got to do is um, unboxing videos. Um, I We got a pile. I got stuff I got for my birthday. I've got that stuff that showed up. I've got that aroma therapy game i got a whole bunch of stuff to unbox i don't even know what to do with the aventuria like that would take me eight to twelve hours just to unbox all that yeah you, so you I don't, don't do... think i'm doing that in one <laughs> setting so yeah, i don't even you're know. not allowed to do that many boxes in one yeah setting. like we've, sean we've... has generally set the limit at five or six depending on how big the games are so and then the other one is i i don't know what to do with the anachrony i can't decide do people care like if you miss the kickstarter you can't get it now like, yeah, like, I, that I one think I'm I have just going to open that one open. Oh. Yeah, that one I have to say, I, I don't think it's worth it's worth. Like, I'm excited to see it. what's in it, and I kind of want to share that with people, but I don't. I think that one I'm just going to open on my own. Or, or and I mean, the, I mean, you know, if you throw it on a stream and, and have fun with it, but don't worry about recording. Like, yeah, not, you know, if you want to, if you want to have fun with it and enjoy it, great. But it's not something that we'll probably share for content. Yeah. Plus, like, some of the stuff was loose already. Like, yeah. I already saw the metal things. Like, I didn't realize they were going to be loose in that big box. 
I don't even know what's in it. What I, what I have been doing is rearranging my game room to fit that, <laughs> which has taken way more work. It has taken most of this week. Now I, I haven't done it dedicated. Um, one of the things that's what I do when my Fitbit tells me it's time to move. I get up, I go downstairs, I rearrange the shelves until it says, hey, you've moved enough this hour. Then I go back to work. So I don't know how many minutes I've spent on rearranging, but like, it's been a total, like I have pulled off entire, the entire A section has been redone. And so yeah, I've been redesigning my game room. So yeah, I got to do, I got to do unboxing videos. Um, those might happen this week, this weekend. We'll see. Um, it was nice playing something that wasn't a pile of obligation. I don't know. There's just something relaxing, freeing about that. Like you probably won't be seeing a full junk art review. That you, you basically got it. You got my first thoughts. Next time I play it, we'll talk about it. I probably will leave that game on the shelf until we get out to a game night. And then when we get out to a game night, I'll bring it out. We'll be talking about it again. Well, well, well. We know your uh, your cough seems to be getting better. You're not. Yeah. Uh, you haven't been muting yourself tonight. So uh, and we've got a few more in the uh, pile before we run out. So you know, yes. worst case. We've still got some room. Yeah, that is the one thing I'm not doing. I am not accepting any new review material right now. We might be set for 2021 at this point. <laughs> I'm, I, I've got enough stuff of my own to worry about. And it's like I said, it's been nice not to have that pressure of the pile of obligation, I guess. Like, yes, right. I enjoy reviewing review copies, too. And it's and the stuff we've gotten recently has been amazing. Like, the stuff from Good Games Publishing has been really good. The stuff from The Op has blown us away. The Ravensburger stuff has been good. Like, these have been top-notch games and i'll admit i'm not going hey send me everything i pick and choose when signing up for this stuff so it is cool but i think we we may be moving back away from the cult of the new and back into the the good old games days now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our vip guests our patreon backers we greatly appreciate their support Ah, we've got the team at the Misdirected Mark Gaming Podcast. You can catch them Tuesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern as they talk games and game mastering. They're also here on Twitch. Just search Misdirected Mark. Uh, Joe Swick, thanks so much for your support. Evil John, we got to go hunting for Planet Nine. I'm hoping to get that in this weekend. We're going to, I don't even remember what mission we were on. Uh, 18 is what we finished. 18. We're going to try to play some of the crew. Uh, Matt Lichtenwaller. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Roger Malash, speaking of bringing out games like Jump Corbett to play in person, I would have guessed last year by February that we'd be uh, sitting together at the CD Realm, but sorry, that hasn't happened again, but I do look forward to sharing a table with you again. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com and sign up for the Tabletop Bellhop newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. If you like the content we're providing, it would be awesome if you would support our continued efforts by tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thanks for joining us and be sure to stick around and join us in the pedo suite for the after show for Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. I'm Sean. And I'm Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.